Good morning, everybody. I hope you're having a good time so far. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our new president to you. Um, Joe, we get, he's just a laid back guy, so we call him Joe. He's been at Laramie County Community College since January, and um, it's been exciting times since then. He told me I could kind of ad lib this, so I'm just going to tell you about the things I'm excited about since Joe's been here. Um, he's really come in with a lot of energy, and he started us on some projects that have been in some ways long overdue. We have a new set of key indicators. We're looking at um, better reporting structures in our assessment and evaluation across the board. Um, he has kind of increased my workload <laughs> substantially. Um, but the most exciting thing for me, and the reason I was glad he was able to come this morning, is that he really gets what we do. Um, he asks good questions, he listens to the answers, and um, if he weren't busy doing other things, I think he would be an awesome candidate for the data analyst position I have open. <laughs> so um, without further ado, do Joe Schaefer from LCCC. I was just saying, we'll call that job security for you, Ann, um, trying to keep you busy. So uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for allowing me to come sh and share a few remarks with you this morning. Um, uh, for those of you that are visitors to, to Wyoming, I, I want to say welcome. And on behalf of the uh, other six presidents of the Wyoming Community Colleges and uh, Dr. Tom Buchanan, the president of the University of Wyoming, who unfortunately couldn't be here today, um, uh, we're happy to have you in our great state. And we are proud. Uh, to be hosting the, the 2012 Rocky Mountain Association of Institutional Researchers Conference and, and glad that you're here in Laramie with us. So welcome all of you. Um, I appreciate that. Um, it, it's exciting for me to, to have the opportunity to talk a little bit about institutional research from the, the president's perspective. Um, and, uh, and, and I've been thinking about this. I, I haven't had as much time to, to think about what I wanted to, to share with you today. And part of that is because uh, I'm, I'm a little bit nervous. And it's funny, I've presented before legislators and before dignitaries and, and, and folks um, that, that you think would make you nervous. But, uh, but you as a group are the one group that I know, unlike those other ones, are all smarter than I am. <laughs> so so I, better, I better have uh, my, my game face on for this morning. But, but I do want to just share a, 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 f a few remarks. Um, one of the first things, though, is I want to give you two disclaimers uh, before I jump into my remarks. First, I know that I'm preaching to the choir here. And I also know that you all sing a whole lot better than I do. And what I mean is, from an IR perspective, the things I'm going to probably share with you or say today um, aren't going to be new or probably aren't going to surprise you in any, in any way. Uh, the second one is, and, and Ann will attest to this, I am an IR wannabe, um, by all means. Um, but I am not an expert in your field at all. Um, but I do recognize the value and the work that, that you bring to the table in helping us transform our institutions, um, helping our students succeed, and, and ultimately help our communities prosper. And so I appreciate what you do. And while I uh, am just a wannabe when it comes to institutional research, um, I'm one of your biggest champions. And so I want you to, to know that. So we exist in, in interesting and changing times in higher education right now. And I think we're all feeling that and we're all seeing that. In my estimation, higher ed has gone through three very distinct phases of evolution uh, in the United States. Um, and we started in the 1800s with, with the first phase, what I think of as the establishment phase. This is where the first colleges started to emerge um, shortly after colonial settlement. That went into uh, what I consider the second stage, which is more the, um, the expansion stage or, or the, the proliferation stage where colleges um, started to show up at different places, the, the rise of the university, uh, came about. Uh, the community college movement hit the U.S. and, and started to establish community colleges um, across all of our states. And then the third phase, in mid-1950s, um, 1960s, uh, took us into a phase of what I think of as accessibility, where policymakers and, and, and leaders across the U.S. started to create systems, mechanisms, legislation, and an accompanying investment to make access to higher education um, a cultural norm. There, there, there is a cultural belief in the U.S. as a result of that that we are all 
um, entitled to access to higher education, to access to higher education. I believe that we've now entered into a fourth phase. And let me tell you just a, a brief anecdote. As I started um, moving through my career in higher education, um, I, I started sitting at tables where, where the, the, the leadership, the, the big wigs, the folks that were making the, the, the institutions turn um, would, would discuss, debate, and ultimately make decisions. And I was absolutely astounded, and am to this day, at how many major decisions are made off of anecdote, made off of emotion, made off of whoever can, can give you the most compelling argument at the last minute. And that surprised me. I don't know if we'll have that luxury anymore in the future. Um, this fourth phase that we entered into, probably starting in the late 90s, is, is what I think of as the accountability phase or the productivity phase. And, and you all know this because as your workloads have heightened, um, we are now in a phase where, where those same policymakers that provided the opportunity to make access so important have now shifted and are asking our institutions to start producing results. So it's now time for a focus on outcomes versus inputs into our system. And you're all aware of them, whether it's uh, Complete College America, uh, the Lumina Foundation's Big Gold, American Graduation Initiative, they're everywhere. Uh, initiatives to, that are focused on productivity in higher education um, is, is absolutely everywhere. So this shift into the most recent phase of higher education may also be redefining the role of the institutional researcher. And in fact, I would suggest that, that it is. So I want to speak just briefly about two hot topics today. And, and looking at the, the keynote today, I, I think it'll be, a, I hope I'm at least on the, the right track, uh, judging by the, the program here. The first one is about assessing instructional effectiveness. Um, instructional effectiveness. So far too often, colleges and universities, and from an institutional research perspective, have been focused on assessing institutional effectiveness. So we report enrollment, graduation rates, retention rates, all of those things that we view as institutional outcomes, necessary things to assess. But it's interesting that all the effort and time that is spent on looking at assessing institutional effectiveness, the actual needle hasn't moved all that much. And you could still look whether you're at a university or a community college, and, and those graduation rates, those retention rates, they've stayed pretty stagnant. I believe we spend far too little time looking at instructional effectiveness. Or how effectively does our instruction help students learn what we purport they should be learning and looking at that. So tell me, for example, how many of you come from institutions who are struggling with uh, the assessment of student learning outcomes or have accreditation findings as a result? Oh, you can raise your hand, be honest. <laughs> Thank you. One of, the most, uh, one of the most significant issues facing higher education today, um, lots of institutions are struggling with this. Now tell me, how many of you come from institutions that have student learning assessment nailed down? <laughs> Nobody? I tell you what, if you do package it, go on the road and start a consulting business, because there is a lot of work out there for you to do that. Assessing the effectiveness of our instruction is an intriguingly complex challenge. Historically, we have inherited curriculum, um, or at best, we've developed curriculum, but we've done it in the way that we were taught. Um, and, and through the same eyes and the same, same model that we were taught, we focus on grades or cross-sectional assessment of composite evaluations, and they simply do not suffice for guiding the improvement, let alone understanding where our instruction needs to improve. We need to focus on the establishment of strong, well-defined learning outcomes and common assessment tools across our curriculum so that we can take a look at student learning longitudinally. And then we can focus our, 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 focus our efforts on those areas where we see that our teaching isn't producing the results that we want it to in regards to student learning. And it is a completely different uh, focus. So one of the struggles has been assessment has always been in the domain of the faculty and we believe the faculty do it. We'll do everything out here, we'll give you the data, we'll do all that good stuff, but assessment and how that works, that's the faculty domain. We need to recognize now that it's going to take a team effort for us to really tackle this. And institutional research is going to be a critical element of that team. To be able to assess instructional effectiveness, we're going to have, so have to have sound grounding in educational theory, without a doubt. We're gonna have to understand psychometrics. I love that term, that's a big word for me, but basically, how we measure 
student development, um, learning, and, and those types of things. And of course, we have to have a sound grounding in research principles and data collection and analysis techniques. Which takes me to the second hot topic and something that, um, that I'm, I'm fascinated by um, and continually so is the rise of analytics um, in, in higher education. Um, and, and as I mentioned to you earlier, I'm a, an IR wannabe, I am a data geek, I, I, I love the data, but, but make no mistake, the reason that I love the data isn't because it fascinates me, but rather because it inf provides me, and provides all of us with an informed course of action that we can initiate once we are enlightened by what the data suggests. And that's what's impressive about evidence, about analytics, about data. So I'll give you an example. About a, a month ago, and you've all had this experience, uh, I'm sure, um, with, with shopping and with consumer things, but about a month ago, um, I bought a new truck. Everybody in Wyoming has to have a pickup truck, so I bought a new truck and, um, and needed a few accessories for the, the truck. Um, so I went online, did a Google search, and said I'm looking for a bug shield for the, the pickup truck and found an, an online store. And So I went online and I put in the information about my vehicle, and said here's what I need, um, added some demographic data when I completed my purchase and all that good stuff and, and ordered my bug shield. Um, now because of that information, I get tailored email communications from that that business, that store that say, oh by the way, you might want, you might need, you might like this. And guess what? I've bought now three times from that store. So that's the power of analytics in predicting and even eliciting a certain response from human beings. So you've probably heard of this called business intelligence, um, predictive analytics, uh, action analytics. But the thing is, with the technological advances, we have increase, increased capacity for data collection of ana and analysis, and we have power tools to now help us better predict human behaviors. This also means we can better identify how we might change our own practices to see a heightened response of the desired human behavior. So why is this important to higher education? Well, the big thing is that we can now use data and research to understand what elements in our practices uh, might predict negative outcomes like student tr uh, attrition and change those practices or consider what elements lead to positive outcomes and try to proliferate those. So I like the term action analytics as it shifts the focus from using data for reporting to structured inquiry and research whose findings suggest a course of action for higher education. So think of the potential. What if we could identify the three most common behaviors of students that predict whether or not they will succeed in a course? Or if we could use technology to alert us or our students when opportunities or threats to their success arise during the semester, or maybe schedule our courses more accurately to meet the demands and the needs to keep students on track and fill capacity within our courses. Some colleges and universities have already answered these questions and they're using analytics to do so. Higher education is now just scratching the surface of, of analytics and the use of them. As the field continues to grow, uh, it will require sound understanding of research design as well as structured and rigorous data collection, storage and access mechanisms. And because technology is playing such a significant role in how we can use analytics and how we collect data and do that, you as IR professionals and our entire institutional research workforce is going to also have to, to, to be involved with and have an increased level of technological cognizance to understand the technology and the systems behind um, how we collect and analyze these data. So let me just wrap up by talking a little bit about the changing role of the institutional researcher from, from my perspective. These two examples that I've shared with you today suggest that you will have a significant role in this fourth phase of higher education evolution. And many of you are already feeling this, uh, this pinch, whether it's through the, um, the heightened compliance requirements, um, through expanded uh, data reporting, um, whether it's ad hoc or standard reporting that you have to do on a daily basis, um, you're feeling the, the increased pressure from this change. But now IR is going to be asked and will continue to be asked to do more and play more of a prominent role in complex research design, uh, in data analysis to better understand our practices, and, and I think that's just the beginning. In the future, IR professionals will start to move, if you haven't already, from the periphery to being central members of executive teams and institutional leadership. You'll now be brought into the folds of those historically closed domains, uh, such as academic affairs and institutional leadership and decision making, and people are going to increasingly look to you to help guide the transformation of institutions. In the future, 
That means you as IR professionals will also have to be willing to take on leadership roles. The days of the back office number crunching um, and the, the reporting are, are decreasing and, and, and are going away. You will have to have a vision, excellent communication skills, a strong understanding of planning and resource allocation. And yes, you must still have a penchant for statistics, data analysis. So you mathematicians in the crowd, they're still, they're still used for you <laughs> with, without a doubt. But I want to close by just saying these are exciting times for all of us, and they are really exciting times to be an institutional researcher. Right now, good institutional researchers are hard to find, and that's going to become more and more difficult in the future. This is a wonderful opportunity to start a career and to expand a career. So thank you again for giving me just a few moments to, to share my thoughts from a president's perspective. Thank you for all the work that you do for our colleges and universities and ultimately for our students, and enjoy the rest of the conference.